thinking like a chem fizz pro, right? It is, it's basically this. You have to follow the breadcrumbs. You can't just immediately leap to the loaf. Hunter back for some more MCAT podcast. Think like a pro, the more you know. Ooh. That is our goal here today on the show. Uh, I'm going to keep trying to rhyme like Harry Mack does it uh, on TikTok. I don't know if you, if you watch that guy on TikTok. He is a phenomenal, don't. phenomenal freestyler. Um, but anyway. Nah. I'm, I'm ancient and I'm just starting to get in TikTok. So like, oh, so give, me, give, me, give me some time. Give me some so time. Bad. Go go find Harry Mac official. I think that's his his TikTok. Do I do I go to his website and follow him there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what what what's the what's the pound sign that I use to follow him? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, welcome back to another episode of the Think Like a Pro series. Last week we covered the cars section, uh, where we left kind of are outside thinking at the door. Chemphys, I'm assuming, we have to completely ignore that because we have to have outside knowledge, I think, to do well at Chemphys, yes, no? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, not as much as people think. And there's a lot of like intu like intuition and a lot of conceptualization that can save you a ton of time if you know what you're looking for. But yeah, Chemphys is one of those one of those sections, one of those three science sections where you got to know a bunch of stuff even coming in. Um, I like to tell my tutoring students that the MCAT doesn't reward you just for having your content memorized; it expects it. So that's like you must be this tall to ride the ride, and then everything after that is kind of what you have to practice after. What does that What does that mean? I don't I don't get it. Um, so basically all of your, your, your concepts, right? Yeah. So your gen chem, your orgo, uh, your, um, physics, your just everything that's going on in that section, right? Yes. You need to know all the formulas. First of all, yes, you need to know all the, the concepts and what's going on. And yes, there's a very good chance that none of it's going to even pop up because <laughs> physics and orgo is only like, you know, 15% of this section. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, that's kind of like the bare minimum. Like if you know all of that stuff really, really well, and it's, it's kind of like the back of your hand, I don't, I'm not going to say that's 50th percentile. Um, that's, that's probably like upper 60th percentile. Right. But a lot of the, a lot of students that come to me for, you know, the private tutoring and stuff like that are like, no, Hudge, I want to be in those, those upper percentiles. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, what's the difference here? And so many times I get frustrated, like, you know, conversations or emails from students are like, what the heck is going on? Like, if you just <laughs> ask me, what is Bernoulli's equation? I have it. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what it is. This yep. is Pasoulis and everything else that rhymes together. Right. Um, and, and, and I'm still missing questions and I don't understand why. Usually that's because we're not taking the next step, which is, yes, you have this information inside of you. You are this tall. You can ride the ride. But the rest of the ride is like, OK, now I need to apply it to this passage that maybe is talking about things that I've never studied before. Maybe it is talking about something that I've studied before, but it's going way too in depth than like I never I've never even heard of these words before. Right. Most of the time, it's just unraveling the secret and like finding the clues and then go, oh, OK, so they're just asking me for this. Right. And like it's it's a lot more conceptualization than students kind of crack it out to be because this is like the math section. What what I'm hearing you say is you have to know it. But it's more than just knowing it. You have to understand it. Yes. And this is where one of my one of my H3s, Hunter's Helpful Hints, what up? Um, one of my H3s come up, up. And all the time I say to my students, concepts over content. And like in inevitably, there's going to be a couple of students that are like, oh, <laughs> Hunter told me I don't have to memorize my content. Um, not at all. Again, that is the bare minimum. You must have the content. But it's the concepts that are going to get you the points. It's understanding, okay, if they're describing this scenario, I have to understand that, all right, there's a car and it's taking a left turn and it's on a slippery road and there's a friction coefficient and they want to know what incline does the road have to be on so that the car doesn't fly upwards it, and doesn't slide downwards. It stays exactly where it is. So what the heck is all of this? It's like an incline plane, sort of, but the car is going that way against centripetal motion. And you have to recognize that's the force that's at play here, not like a box sliding down. It's centripetal motion pushing it up and flips the whole thing. 
hey, you can have those equations memorized. And I'm sure a bunch of students do. Like, oh, this is what centripetal is. This is what frictional forces, so on and so forth. But they're still going to miss that question because yeah. they didn't like picture what's going on and think about the bigger concepts at play. Okay, so so let's uh, lean into the series, right? Thinking like a pro, how do they from hopefully someone's listening to this while they're still in their undergraduate physics course or chem class, how do they take what they're learning and start to think like that MCAT pro that goes, okay, here's the basic fundamental knowledge. How am I going to have to manipulate this to do well on the MCAT? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love your question. Hate my answer. So if you're still in your undergraduate and you're doing physics right now, my answer to this question is actually learn it. <laughs> um, I'm guilty of this. I know the majority of us are too, but um, you know, you, you, it, the thing about undergraduate, it's very linear and predictable. Yeah. And when you get really intelligent people and you give them something that's very predictable, we just naturally figure out how to become very efficient at it. And efficiency yeah. is just being lazy and smart at the same time. Right. And so what do we do? We, cram the week of and it's all just covering one chapter so you don't even have to worry about the units you don't have to worry about other formulas because it's all the same formula you yep. rock that exam on friday yep. and then you immediately forget about it until Urgent. you know your midterm or your your fin uh, finale <laughs> until your <laughs> final comes is. up yeah um so and then, so and your then grade is not a reflection of your understanding Oh my God, no, I'm, <laughs> there are so many students that are, that are sub 3.0 worrying that they're not smart enough to get into med school when really they're like one of the best critical thinkers I've ever worked with. And I barely have to do anything and they're getting these 515s, 520s. And I've also had so many students that are perfect 4.0s and they're like, I don't understand why am I getting, you know, 480s and stuff like that. So like, that's one of the, oh, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here. That's one of the things I say all the time in private sessions, not on a publicly recorded podcast, but we're going for it. Um, the MCAT is not at all a predictor of like intelligence, of competence or anything like that. Like it's a very specific skill. And like, I feel like Liam Neeson, like I have a very particular skill set and I will teach you how to hunt down and find the 528s. Um, but like, that's all that it is. I'm just really good at taking the MCAT and like, I know the language yeah. of the test, right? Yeah. That's the biggest thing that I try to teach my students because a lot of the times, they can get the concepts and like the content on their own. Yeah. It's all the other stuff that goes into it. So to answer your question, sorry, I totally like, yeah, you hit me with that. And just, you turned down like Rantville. Um, yeah. But yeah, what, no, what I, it, what I tell students is the MCAT is a test to see how well you can take the MCAT. That's it. Yeah. Yep. 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 And like, I always get like, why, why does it exist and stuff like that? And like, you know, you hear like, it's a weed out to make so money. And so forth. It, <laughs> yeah, I saw a Reddit thread that was really interesting. I was like, the MCAT's going to go away. And it's like, no, it's not. It makes too much money. Like, the, there's so many people whose livelihood is this. Yeah, anyway. it's it's a $40 million line item for the AMC. Yeah, come on. Come on. Um, so we just have to, you know, stick it to the man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just take a deep breath and not get mad. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of the first thing is... I have too many students of mine that I work with that I, I know really well because, you know, over the course of 20, 40 hours of us hanging out together with two hour sessions, like we just become, you know, fast friends and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden they're beating themselves up saying like, oh, I'm not smart. I'm not intelligent. And they're questioning and doubting themselves when it's really just the test and the test is just to beat them up. Yeah. And that's not in predictor of intelligence. So yes, long winded answer to your question. Yes. The, the understanding the chem and the content, your GPA does not indicate whether or not you conceptually understand what's happening. In fact, I would argue that like most of my students, they got the GPA and they've got the, the, the formulas, but the conceptual understanding is something that they've never even been challenged for in their undergraduate career because they're so good at like rocking the exam and rocking just the GPA game. Right. Yeah. Um, so and then they hit this MCAT and it's just like a, a, a hitting a brick wall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things, which is a physics equation, yeah. by the way, how many, <laughs> by, by how many Newtons? I want to know, um, <laughs> such nerds. Um, <laughs> did that wall push back at an equal and opposite reaction, uh, force, whatever, completely um, elastic collision. <laughs> we have talked about before on this podcast that units is a huge way of maybe shortcutting some things is a firm understanding of unit conversion and what units mean. Is that thinking like a chem phys pro? Yeah, a thousand percent. Um, 
the units not only are going to tell you sometimes if you have no idea how to start a question, right? Like you're reading it and it's in, like uh, almost another language and you're like, what the heck am I looking at? Mm. If you check out the units and you see joules, oh, okay, this is going to be one of my either energy equations or my like work equations or something like that. Um, if you see watts, then you go, oh, cool. It's just energy per second. And you can kind of start to parse together. Where do we talk about seconds in the passage? Oh, that's in one of the figures. How many seconds did it run for? So yeah, if you understand, like the the units are just a really good breadcrumb, and more or less, this is if there's going to be like a summary of thinking like a chem phys pro, right? It is. It's basically this: you have to follow the breadcrumbs. You can't just immediately leap to the loaf, right? So, so many students, what what I see, like physically see happening when we're in our sessions together, is they'll read the question, and then I'll see their eyes dart across all the answers, and then they get really wide. <laughs> because <laughs> none of them just suddenly fell in their lap of, oh, of course, this is the right answer. And then I just see them reread the answers for like four or five times. And yeah. by the time I kind of step in, it's been a minute and a half. We're out of time. We have to move on and we're no closer to the answer. So yeah. this is the number one thing I say is you have to follow the breadcrumb. So units, excellent breadcrumb, right? Other than that, the thing that I want my students to pay attention the most in is the question. The question has so many clues. And like, if you don't know where to start, yeah, that's by design. It's a, they're, they're asking you a tough question and you have to sit and think about it and conceptualize. So you take inventory of what is the question giving me? It's giving me a velocity, a mass. I already know what the acceleration is. And it, they said started at rest. Great. This is a super basic kinematics equation, but whatever. You now know you have these variables. There's three different kinematics, four if you include the average acceleration, whatever, uniform acceleration. There's three kinematic equations. Um, and, oh, okay, I have enough to use kinematic equation number one, but then once I solve for number one, that gives me time, which I have to use for number three, and then I can get my answer. Cool, whatever. So all of that is like you have to follow the breadcrumbs. You can't just expect to read the answers and the answer is just going to fall in your lap unless. Unless. Ha, 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 edge of your seat. Unless you do have a really good understanding of those units, right? So I actually just did this example last week. There was... You know, they, they said we had 250 milliliters of something and, you know, uh, one liter of another thing. And we're making some really some really janky uh, electrochemistry circuit. Right. With with, you know, we got an anode, cathode, some chemicals. Cool. Um, and it's asking, like, what's the total amount of watts that this thing could produce uh, over like 10 seconds? And the answer choice is three of them were in kilojoules. And I was like, whoa, like this is this is going to blow up a house. If we have, you know, a hundred thousand <laughs> kilojoules, that's an incredible amount of energy for like 10 grams of salt. Like, so if you can just kind of look at that and go like, Oh, no way. Is it these, it's gotta be the smallest one here. That's another great example of just like conceptual understanding over, mm. con uh, con wait. Yeah. Conceptual understanding over just like pure content and like rote memorization. I'm going to calculate this. Okay. What else? <sighs> Breadcrumbs are really important. Um, I think, uh, especially when it comes to chemistry one. So we've been talking about physics a lot because like physics is the scary one for a lot of students. Yeah. Um, it's also not super frequently tested. Like you're going to get a lot more gen chem and stuff like that too. Um, so at least when you're talking like the gen chem stuff, it's really similar concepts. What you're going to get, um, similar concepts to what we were just talking about, excuse me. What you're going to get a lot of the time is a question that sounds Earlier, but it's referencing stuff in the passage that you have no idea what it is, right? So like maybe, yeah, you've heard of, you've heard of lipids and stuff like that, but now we're talking about glycosphingolipids and you have no idea what the structure is. And here's like giant, like, uh, you know, poly A tails and, and a, a gross looking like head on the top of it. That's your lipid on all this other stuff. And it freaks us out because it looks overly complicated. Whenever that happens, the number, again, again, I'm just a broken record, Ryan. Again, it's all in the question, right? So just rephrase the question into what is it really asking me? And like, no joke, it sounds hyperbolic, but a lot of the times you can simplify those really complex looking like chemistry questions into, oh, they just want to know like how many hydrogens there are, or like which one of these is hydrophobic or which one's nonpolar or whatever it is, right? Um, so simplifying the questions, again, it goes to like the AMC just using their own terminology that arbitrarily makes this test super difficult. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's almost just rephrasing their words into your own that way. I, I always call it my lizard brain, you know, my, yeah. my, my high end brain back there that reptiles got. That's basically if, if that part of my brain understands it, then I know I'm in a good spot. Yeah, this this is a little bit maybe outside of of this thinking like a pro series, but is 
acting like a pro, maybe if I were to add that different verb on there, um, in terms of as soon as your instruction time starts, using that pen and paper that you get, the the wet erase marker uh, and laminated sheet, and writing down equations, trying to memorize a bunch of stuff, and then brain dump it, is that smart? Do you recommend that, or is that just... A, a tactic that some people use? So it, it is a tactic that some people use. That's a really good question. I, I actually get this a lot from my students. Um, I would say it's 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 almost 50-50 my opinion on it, right? I would honestly lean a little bit more towards don't bother and it's, it's more gimmicky than anything. But for some students, A, it's definitely a comfort thing. Like yeah. I just feel more comfortable having it. And if you feel more comfortable during that section of the test, you're going to do a lot better. Like, trust me. Um, if you're sitting there panicking, like, Things have already gone wrong. So that's the number one. Don't panic, right? Um, but the reason why I normally kind of lean away from it is, number one, if you've got that great conceptual understanding, like I was saying, a lot of times, even if you might forget the formula, you can still probably get pretty close to your answer, either like 50-50 or sometimes you don't even need the formula. And it like they set it up to make it look like it does. And the formula just gets in the way. So yeah. if you've got that good conceptual understanding, it's less important to have every piece of content memorized, which is awesome. Um, cause it's so much better to just think about something instead of stressing out, trying to re remember your memorization. Come on. Thinking is way more fun than memorizing. Um, and then if you do have a list in front of you, as far as like these, I brain dumped all these equations. It, sometimes we can subconsciously treat that like a word bank and think like, this is it. And I must use all of these. And there's nothing else outside of this, which like, you know, you might've forgotten one or two. And all of a sudden, like you're reading a problem where if you didn't have this list staring you in the face and you're trying to make one of these formulas fit that problem. Instead, if you were just kind of thinking about it more conceptually, that equation might've come to you in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. So those two reasons are normally why I say don't do it. That being said, again, if it's a comfort thing, go for it. Um, and some students, I've, <laughs> this was actually one of my best favorite answers when I asked the student, like, hey, how come you're doing this? Like, you know, is there a reason for it? <laughs> they were like, honestly, I got about eight equations memorized out of like the hundred that I need. So I just put those eight down and whatever. <laughs> I'm like, all right, so I can't, can't even fault you for that. Like you're being honest with me. So yeah, if it's one of those go for it, but usually I, you, you know, usually you can have good critical thinking skills and don't need that, that work okay. bank of equations in front of you. 